We are so excited to be here tonight. Praise God. I'm a little like the man at the gate called beautiful tonight. I, I, I'm expecting to receive something. <laughs> yeah, praise the Lord. It matters how you come to church. Well, I don't know. I, I don't think I'm going to go. I don't know if I'm going to get anything. You wouldn't anyhow. You wouldn't have got anything. <clears throat> you got to come hungry, right? Come expecting, come believe in God. And uh, this church, we believe in, in uh, you know, the preaching and teaching of the Word. We also believe that signs and wonders follow the teaching and preaching of the Word. And we don't have people in here that don't believe that either. Dr. Jacobs believes in signs, wonders, and miracles. I'm sure he'll tell a lot of stories, and we just want whatever God has for us tonight. <clears throat> Dr. Jacobs stands there. We've, we got to know them back whenever we got connected with Dr. Dufresne. Back in, uh, we got connected with Dr. Dufresne in 2002. I think you were a few years before that. And uh, we, of course, started going to Dr. Dufresne's meetings and started meeting other ministers that were hooked up with him. And um, one of the ones hooked up the most was Dr. Jacobs and his wife, who's now going on to heaven. Uh, Diana's uh, connection with him was real strong. And we respected that and we honored that. And uh, God gave us that connection with Dr. Dufresne and Pastor Nancy. So there was a, uh, an instant camaraderie. That we didn't know each other. I'm speaking for myself. My wife and I just seemed like an instant camaraderie with some of the ministers there. Just like spirit and like, like precious faith. Amen. And contending for the move of God and believed in, you know, signs and wonders and miracles. And they weren't just part of our doctrine. We actually would move in it, you know. And so somebody else believes like we believe, you know. And so it was so refreshing, and, and I'm honored that he would come, and we asked him to come. Of course, he's been here before. This is not his first time, but he has uh, so graciously agreed to come again for this weekend. So we're blessed. <clears throat> he's caught a lot from Dr. Dufresne, and he stands in the office of the prophet. You know that. And, uh, you know, that's not something to be scared about. Uh, unless you're not living right. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, no. Everybody's for you here tonight. Isn't that right? <laughs> Praise God. He brought one of his spiritual sons, Dr. Keith Rogan, Pastor Keith Rogan from Ten Tennessee, Nashville area. Brother, Brother Rogan, would you stand up and just uh, let everybody see who, who you are? Praise God. <clears throat> He and his wife pastor a church, actually two churches in Nashville. So uh, we're honored that you would come. Thank you for coming and being a part of the meetings. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, that the, uh, the thing about Dr. Jacobs, and I'm not taking any more time. This is my last thing I'm going to say, is that uh, you're going to hear experience tonight. You know, this is not a man that read a book and is here to parrot a book. This isn't parrot Jacobs tonight. This is Dr. Jacobs. And he has experience with God. He's the real deal. Uh, you know, this is somebody that uh, has proven some things out. How many of you like to, like to get around that kind, of, that kind of others in the body of Christ and ministry that they, they've proven some things out and they're walking some things out? They've got testimony. They bear witness to it. It is demonstrated in their life. It's working in their life and working in their ministry. And that's who you're going to hear tonight. You're going to hear that seasonedness. If you were to hit on him, you would hear a solidness. You would hear a, a, a solid thud. You wouldn't hear a tingy sound of an echoing preacher. You know what I'm talking about? Echoing somebody else. But you're going to hear the real deal tonight. So would you go ahead and stand? Come with me. Uh, come bring the pulpit if you would. Stand and welcome Dr. Jacobs this evening. Hallelujah. Dr. Jacobs, just obey God. Praise God. Thank you, Pastor Jay. Let me give you a hug. Thank you. Love you, too. Wow. Who, who was that guy he was talking about? I don't... <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. You could be seated. Boy, what a good group for Friday night. This is wonderful. Yeah. Well, I'm going to be teaching about angels. Yep. And uh, I've only been doing that for 42 years, so cut me a little slack, if you would. Yeah, I'm serious. Cut me a little slack here. Uh, but there's just a lot to learn about that. There's a lot to learn, and so I think I'm going to wait on some of this for another session. But 
It's good to be with you, and I appreciate Pastor Jay and Debbie inviting me. It was a great honor to be invited and to come. And we have been friends for a long time, but we just hadn't seemed like uh, been together together, you know, together physically where we could fellowship and talk. And we already been in the meeting, Pastor Jay and I, because he's been taking care of me. So <laughs> all the rides in an automobile and, you know, just things like that. Praise the Lord. Let's go, let's go over here for a minute to the book of Mark 16. And, uh, you know, I, I would say this, not apologizing for it, just I'm not bragging either, but we're just going to go to look at a lot of scriptures. I'll try to give as many as to you as I can. And I think we have, if I'm thinking right, four sessions with you. So that gives me some leeway of what I'm picking and choosing to teach. Uh, in 1995, I'd already been teaching on angels since 1980. So that's 42 years. But uh, in 95, I took the church I was then pastoring. My son now pastors that church because he was called to be a pastor and he's known nothing his whole life but be serving at church. But um, we taught 15 Wednesday nights in a row on this subject in 1995. Now listen to me. I didn't even get taught what I knew in 95. And so this, we're not talking about what God uh, has. Is there's much, much more to this. And I'm still studying. I'm not, I didn't say that to be cute or act like I'm real whatever. I study things over and over again. And somebody said, how did you know there were 300 references to angels? You find it on your computer? No, I took a reference book, a strong concordance, and looked them up one at a time and read them thoroughly and talked to the Father about every one of them. And there's 100 of the 300 references to angels. Now, this, you know, I'm, not try I'm just trying to talk to you. Yeah. I'm going to slow down a little because I'm running quick here. Uh, but 100 of those, they came and appeared and talked and spoke and ministered to humans on this planet. So when I say some of the things I'm going to say later, I I'll probably talk about some of the visions. Maybe not tonight. I might talk about one or two, but we'll see how the Lord leads me. But what I'm saying is this is a broad subject. I don't know of any subject, me personally, now Pastor Jay, he's a really smart guy, really spiritual too. He may have a different slant on this, and so that's fine too. I, don't, I think money is mentioned more in the Bible than about anything that I think, can think of, and I don't teach on money all the time. I have it. I have money. I like it. But I know something about it, but, but the point I'm making is I don't even think there's 300 scriptures on the subject of faith in the whole Bible that I could look up in a reference thing. I don't think it even come close to the 300. So my point in saying that is not to put anybody down or elevate me. The point I'm saying is this is a huge portion of the Bible yeah. from Genesis to Revelation. Yeah. And by the way, there's 68 references in the book of Revelation alone to angels at the end time. It's picking up. And because we're in the beginning of a move of God, in my opinion, I don't think we're into it fully yet, but wherever we're at, ankles or knees, whatever, I mean, there's just always an influx of angels with every move of God or fresh refreshing that comes. You can call it whatever you want, but anyway, I just thought I'd share that with you. So I'm going to try to minister some things, talk to you and read a scripture here in just a minute. Mark 16, put it in park. I'll be right back. <laughs> Uh, some people ask me, how is it that you have so many manifestations of angels in your life and ministry? And my answer to that question is, what do you ever teach about it? Have you ever studied it? Yeah. I mean, really studied it. I don't mean just because you went to the concordance and there's 15, 15 references. I mean, you've studied the subject and you've asked some questions. Yeah. That's one of the things that I think that I've done from the get-go. I don't know why I did that. I just asked a lot of questions of God. Yeah. And you know, he's not a mute. He'll talk to you if you'll take time to talk to him and then listen. <laughs> and he'll give you a lot of insight. So I wrote this here. When you start believing in the ministry of angels, you'll start having more manifestations of their ministry in your life. But you're going to have to be believing. Uh, and now this would go with this. This is my th thought life here, just taking over a minute. I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, be intense with you or anything. I can get intense and I probably will just because I'm geared that way. But just remember that if I'm screaming, my face is turning red, I love you. Okay, everybody, hold on. That's your, my agape to you. That's all you get. But. So my question would be, like if I stood at the door tonight and asked, a, a, interviewed every person that came through the door, you believe in angels? Oh, yeah, Dr. Jenkins, I sure do. Well, can you give me one incident in your personal life that you prayed or released an angel and you have, a, you have fruit of that coming to pass? Do you have any, it's, it's even one. And most people go, uh, I say, well, what, you've got one? And they kind of look at me like I'm looking. Uh, wait a minute, I'll find one, hang on. 
then that says to me, you really don't believe in it. You just believe it's possible and you believe that angels is in the Bible, you know, the word angel. <laughs> okay. So anyway, and I don't know at all about this subject. So, and I know sometimes people's minds just run with them because they don't know something and they're trying, but you need to, here's the key to this, all the stuff I'm going to teach you and even the visions. Uh, it's not important what an angel looks like. That's never a question you should ask me. I will tell you of some of them maybe, but the point, they didn't all look alike either. They were all different sizes, different levels of anointing. You know, there's an angel in the, I think the 12th chapter of Acts that came and got Peter out of prison. And it says he lit up the cell. But there's another angel in the book of Revelation, it's not Jesus either, that lit up the whole planet earth in a time to come. That's just an angel and an angel, but that's a lot of variance. <laughs> so anyway, I hope I can answer some. One, one lady, I went and did a meeting for a lady I'd never met before, her and her husband. They pastor a church in Pennsylvania, nice people, a Raymond grad. And she asked me if I'd come teach her ladies, a ladies meeting just open to other people in the community too about angels. I said, I'd love to. So one of the questions they asked me, she wanted to know if I'd have a question and answer time with them. I said, I will under one condition, Pastor. You get a little index card and give it to the people that think they want to ask me a question because I'm not going to spend the whole time answering a complicated question that I could have answered 10 others, but because they wanted to know something that's just way out there. Even if I know the answer, I'm not going to waste all that time on one person's question. But one lady asked me that, do I have to know what the angel's name is? I said, who told you that? No. They don't have to know what the demons are either. You just tell them to come out and they'll obey you. What does it matter if they're, uh, you know, something or something, David or John? It don't make a bit of difference. All right, let me read this scripture. I'm going to tell you something my, my granddaughter said to me a while back. Uh, here in Mark 16, I'm just capsulizing this a little bit. I'm trying to hone some things down. When I got my manuscript for my book, it was 520 pages, and the Lord started laughing at me. <laughs> He said, Michael, 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 you're, you're not going to be able to preach, preach, preach all that in the earth. People don't even know the basics of what you're talking about. You're way out there. Not that you're wrong, but cut that down to about 100 pages and write it so a third grader could understand it. So if you can't read my books, I, I need to pray for your mind and your brain to work. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, and I always try to just talk plain and just simple. That's just the kind of person I've been. But in Mark 16, 20, this one scripture, and they went forth and preached everywhere, including Cedar Rapids, Iowa, 2022. And the Lord worked with uh, Dr. Jacobs and confirmed the word with signs following. So just to let you know, this is how I think about whatever I'm approaching to teach. If I was teaching on marriage, I'd expect God to help you improve your marriage. If you're talking about living a long time, I'd expect you to start doing things right now. I encourage you, I started thinking about living a long time when I was about 35 or 40. And I almost died, but God spared me and I got back on track and things like that. But if I'm teaching on angels and he says he's going to confirm the word, then it would stand to reason angels are going to come help us. Yeah. <laughs> All the ones that work with me, they're here with me because that's where they stay with me. Unless I send them forth, some of them I can do. Some of them have to stay with me for other reasons I can tell you later. So it says whatever we're preaching, if we're preaching the word, yeah. that he will confirm that word with signs following. And in Greek down here, I'd put a little sticky tab. Supernatural miracles or wonders is what that really means in the Greek. Supernatural miracles and wonders. So let me talk to you about my granddaughter for just a minute. Let's move over though to Hebrews chapter 1. And we'll just park over there a minute. Uh, and I'm going to uh, do a lot of teaching out of Hebrews 1 and a little bit out of Hebrews 2. We got a lot of scriptures. But this was cute. My granddaughter, she's now about nine. I think she was about five then, maybe six, maybe six. And her mother put her in a Lutheran preschool. So she calls up, she, and Grandma got the phone. She says, it's Natalie, that's my granddaughter, it's my son's daughter. She wants to talk to you, Papa. I said, hi, honey, what's up? Well, Mommy said that you see angels. Is that right? Yes. Not all the time, but I do see them. Well, I want you to tell me how I can see an angel. Now, just to show you what kind of person I am, I don't lie to children either. <laughs> So I said, honey, I can't give you permission to do that. You have to talk to Jesus about that personally. 
So we went on, I don't know. Oh, she said, she said, Mommy said you had a book. I said, I do. Well, I don't have one. Well, honey, I'll get you one, would you? I said, yeah. I said, do you even read yet? No, but Mommy said she'd read it to me. Mm-hmm. So anyway, we were and so when I got done, and it was very really cute because she's kind of, a, when you get her going, she could really go with you. And I got a grandson like that, one of the three grandsons I have. He's a, he's a talker and communicator, and I like that about people, especially if they're close to me, because I don't want to feel like they're hiding everything. Anyway, uh, so I, what was neat is when I would answer, she would respond like a real human being, like an adult that's letting me talk for a minute. And finally, I said to her, well, honey, tell, tell Grandpa what, uh, why are you wanting to know about angels all of a sudden? Well, I want to pray for my friends. I said, well, I can't tell you you're going to see an angel. I said, Natalie, you don't have to see an angel to receive the benefits of it. I'm saying that to all of you too. My opinion is not everybody's ever going to see it in that realm. You have to operate in these things, a dream, which is a vision in the night, normally night seasons, like Joseph had, you know, Joseph and Joseph and Mary, that Joseph. Or you'd have to have visions, which can be in all different ways with your eyes wide open, your eyes closed, all kinds of stuff. And then, then discerning of spirits. And I operate in two of those already. But I told her, you know, you'd have to see what God has for you, honey, if you're going to, but you don't have to see anything to, what you have to do, and I wrote it down, you have to believe. Faith is required. Yeah. So what are you getting this for? I want to pray for my friends at church, Avery and Bella. I said, well, okay, could you pray with me right now? Yeah. And I just led her in a prayer. Father, Father, she repeated me. And I said, Father, I pray for Bella and Avery. And she repeated that the angels that have charge over them will keep them safe today. In Jesus' name, amen. She read it off perfect. I said, can you do that every day? I sure can. That's all you need to do, honey, right now. You don't have to make it complicated. I'm talking to a five or six-year-old right now. It, 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 I'm not getting to the punchline. I'm going to tell you what that was, which I already knew what it was going to be. But she said, I told my class and my teacher all about you, Papa. You told her that I see angels? Yeah. <laughs> And some people call you the angel man. I never called myself that. I'm just a man that knows a little bit about angels. And I said, what did your teacher say? This was the big one. I, nothing. That's what she said, nothing. She didn't say nothing. I said, I figured as much. And I don't think many people know much about them, you know. But anyway, now let me, let me, I'm going to read out of Hebrews in just a minute. But let me, this is a prophecy, this I am a doctor. You see that writing? <laughs> I like my colorful too. This is a prophecy that uh, God spoke through Dr. Brother Kenneth E. Hagen in 1988. I think it was at camp meeting if I remember right. Yeah. This prophecy was given in camp meeting 1988. Dr. Brother Hagen, senior, who's in heaven. He had three angels come to him. The first one had to do with the... Um, political realm, I think, the financial realm, excuse me. No, the political realm, then the financial realm, then the third angel. He said a change is coming in the spiritual realm, in the realm in which you minister to Brother Hagin, and in his realm in which others who minister in the spirit minister. Yeah. So this would really pertain to all of us in some level, even if you're not fivefold, you're still a minister of Jesus Christ. Yeah. But he goes on and says that it, Brother, uh, the angel told him the church is just going to go on like they have for years and keep doing the same thing. But then he said this, there will arise an army. And they said that four times, the angel to Dr. Hagen. And they said, uh, these are the beginning of the last days. And these are men and women of God. They're going to be equipped with the power of the Holy Ghost. They'll, they'll learn. This, this is it right here. They'll learn to walk in the spirit. They'll learn to join forces with the forces of heaven. The angels will come and minister unto them. I'm going to tell you about one incident in my life, one out of many in a minute. They'll learn to minister. Let me see here. Where do I go here? Angels will come and minister unto them, and the angels will come and minister with them. I have a lot of angels minister with me. So if I'm ministering to you, if I don't stop and tell you that, it's really not necessary to tell you unless it's a life, life and death thing. I normally don't tell everything I see. It's unnecessary. I just want to see you get results. <laughs> okay. So anyway, praise God. So that just has stuck with me for many years. And I've rehearsed it and read it and thought about it. I'm going to talk about myself first of all, and then I'm going to start telling some stories. Pastor Jay had it pretty much figured out. The older I get, the more stories I tell. Not because I have to, but I have them. 
I have them to tell. Anyway, so I, um, I was a, I'm an ex-drug addict, drug dealer when I got saved in 1971. Uh, I'd really just about lost my mind by then and lost, lost 80 pound shooting speed, methadrine, shooting it. And for three years, I was a drug dealer and a drug user. I was an addict, not just a drug party person. I was an addict. And my life just fell apart eventually because it always does when you do stuff like that. It changes you. So all of a sudden, I went to a doctor uh, for just a checkup, and he took blood out of me. This was about in, uh, I didn't write the date down, I think. Well, let me, let me back it up a minute. Um, 1970... Um, 1971 in December, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I was dating this young girl, a girl senior in high school. I was 21 years old then, and just starting to try to get away from drugs and drug addiction. It's a long story, but what I'm trying to say is um, I got saved at that youth meeting. Uh, praise God. Anyway, I, I, before that, I got sick. I was in the hospital. I had to have surgery. And these three doc doctors came into my bedroom at the hospital. And they said, what did you do for your hepatitis C? I said, are you telling me I have it or I had it? We're telling you you had it. We did enzymes on your, uh, the check on your liver. And it did one half percent of one damage. But normally hepatitis C, if you don't treat it, it's going to kill you because it's going to destroy your liver. <laughs> and you couldn't live like that unless you had an ongoing miracle. There have been people live with minus an organ. Some of them. Uh, and so I said, they said, are you, you familiar with drugs? I said, I was a drug addict till last December. This is May the next year. But I didn't take anything. I got born again. I asked Jesus into my heart. We don't know nothing about that. I said, well, I'm just, that's the only thing I did different other than shoot dope and act crazy. But I don't. So you're telling me I'm healed? He said, yeah, you're healed. But we want to know what you took to deal with that. I said, I didn't take anything. They have something called Inferon now, which is some kind of chemical like chemotherapy. I said, I didn't take any of that. They said, well, you've been healed then. I said, well. But what, this, what hepatitis C does, if you know about drug addicts or you know what that disease is, it can hide in your body for 25 or 30 years and resurface, and then it attacks you and t tries to destroy the thing it started out trying to destroy. I had a guy in my church that was kind of like me, and he shot dope too. I didn't know him back in those days. He's a member of my church, and he went to the doctor. He's having all kinds of problems. He said, well, you got hepatitis C. So I prayed for him, laid hands on him, gave him some scriptures, and God healed him. And the doctor wrote him a letter and said, I don't know, it had to be God with you because you were going to go if you didn't take care of that. So, so anyway, I go to the doctor. This was in May. The original surgery I had was in May of 72. And so that's been a long time. But in 2002, I went to my regular uh, internist guy, and he took blood, and he called me at home. You know something's up when they call you at home. And I said, what's up, doctor? And he said, well, I had to call you because your blood's so weird. I said, well, wait a minute. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> he said, I don't know what to tell you, Michael, but you're in trouble. I can tell you that for a fact. And all your blood acts like it's like that. And it's contaminated somehow. There's something matter. And it's serious. And I need you to come in tomorrow and give me some blood. I said, I'm going out of town tomorrow. I was going to see Dr. Dufresne at Pastor Webb's church in Alabama. I said, I'll come back. I'm coming back Monday. I'll come in Tuesday. You want to put your secretary on the phone? I'll make an appointment right now. Okay, but don't let this go because you're in trouble. I said, okay. So now I had Dr. Frank's number, but I never bugged him. Like some people, you know, if you give a number to somebody, they just bug the two watt out of it. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh my God. I got a lot of words that mean other things than what I'm saying, but it's <laughs> not trying to be nasty or vulgar either. I'm just talking. So I get to the meeting. I was going to call him. I thought, well, I'm going to be there tomorrow. I'm just going to show up. And if I can't, I never tried to push my way around and sit on the front row. It didn't matter where I sat. I was connected to the man, not the position I had. Or I didn't go there to take an offering or get up and do nothing or sell anything. I, was, I just was in love with him in the right way as a mentor. He was a mentor to me, a spiritual father. That's why I wrote my book, Spiritual Father, Spiritual Failure. It's not a very popular book either because people don't want to grow up. Everybody loved it when I wrote about angels. Everybody wants to hear about that. And then I wrote about devils and a few really courageous people wanted to hear about that. I wanted to ask some pastors, so what is wrong with you? You're so afraid for me to teach on angels. What is your problem? You don't know you have authority or something's wrong with you. I've been casting out devils since 78, two years before I started start teaching on angels. I know a little bit more about the devil. So anyway... 
I'm going to write a little note on a piece of paper and hand it to an usher if I can get his attention. Say, give this to Dr. Dufresne. At some point, I have no idea if we're going to go eat in the green room, if they've even got a green room or blue room or whatever they call it. <laughs> and so Dr. Dufresne gets up to speak. Now, he does not know about it. I didn't tell him this. I just got the phone call the day before. And he gets up and he walks around and he kind of fell into a trance like this. <laughs> he said, really still. I'm not standing really still, but anyway, he did. And he, Dr. Jacobs, where are you at? And I said, I'm back here, sir. But 10 rows back, he said, stand out in this aisle. The Lord shows me you have something wrong with your body. Is that right? Yes, sir. He said, there's an angel standing behind you. And then he kind of chuckled. He said, I know you believe in him. I said, I sure do. <laughs> he's the one that encouraged me to write that book. He said, he's here to fix that. About that time, that angel hit me in the head and down I went on the carpet. I got up, got back in my seat and went home on Monday and went to the doctor on Tuesday. He took all the blood he wanted. He said, I, he called me back at home and said, I don't understand it. Everything's perfect with your blood. So, thank you, sir. So, you know, it just pays to be with the right people. But there's a spiritual father to have. He just picked it up in the Holy Ghost. And there was a, probably 50 or 60 pa preachers in that meeting. I was there right when the bell rung, so I was back 10 rows. But, I mean, he just ministered to me. And he ministered to others, too. But, I mean, you can understand how I felt. Yeah. Because the devil started playing with my mind oh, yeah. about the hepatitis C coming back or something. You know, I wasn't fearful, but I didn't like that, that he was taunting me with that. Thank you, sir. So, anyway. Now, let's talk a little bit about these angels. Before I get into Hebrews, because I may stay at Hebrews for a while. i got a lot more to say, but... Uh, I was at doing a meeting in Chesapeake, Virginia about, I'd say 12 years ago. And I came, uh, it was, there was five or six preachers in a camp meeting in Chesapeake and they rented a room in a Marriott hotel. We, I came for lunch that day and one of the other speakers, he was up speaking at the luncheon. He did a great job. His name's Jerry McGee. He came back to the table where I was seated. I'd never met the man before in my life. I'd met his son. And he said, hey, my name's Jerry McGee. I said, hi, uh, brother. He's an evangelist type guy. He's kind of a motorcycle guy. I don't know that he's got a Harley. I don't, he rides a lot. He told me that later. He said, Pastor Jacobs, I got a problem with my spine. I said, well, I have an awning for spines and bones and all that. And I, I said, I'm not going to pretend it's a word of knowledge. You just told me, are you going to be here tonight? Yeah, I'll be here. I said, well, I'm preaching. I'm going to preach on angels and we'll help you. I'll lay my hands on you and let that anointing go in for your spine. Yeah. And a lot of people healed of spinal injuries, neck injuries, bone injuries, all kinds of stuff. So I'm, he's about halfway back. He, if he had a Bible, I never saw it. I'm not making fun, just listen to the story. So I'm preaching on angels and I'm looking at him and he looks like he's getting madder by the moment. And I think I'm, I'm plowing his field sideways. You know what that means? I'm fooling with him. He's saying, because I'm not sure if he even believes in him yet. So I go back to him when I said to him at the luncheon, I said, listen, I, this is the way I operate. I get up and preach and teach. And then when I know it's time for me to step away, I close my Bible and I start doing whatever he tells me to do. So I went back. I said, Jerry, step out here. And I went back to him about 10 or 12 feet and I laid hands on his head for his back. And I let that anointing go. I said, that anointing's for your spine. And all of a sudden an angel came around my right side like this and he stuck his finger down here and he started rolling something. I said, Jerry... That angel's rolling something down here in your body. I don't know what it is, but he's rolling it. And he turned around and ran out of the meeting. I thought, man, I've ticked him off for good now. He's gone. <laughs> I don't know if he's getting in the car and driving home. He's going to his room upstairs. I don't know where he's at. The back door shut and he in there. So I just went ahead and ministered to the people that were still with me. They didn't get mad like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, he wasn't really mad, but so about five minutes later, he comes in the back and this is the way he looks. I said, Jerry, what happened to you? He said, you probably noticed I didn't seem too friendly tonight. Yeah, I did notice that. He said, well, the reason was, and I didn't tell you this, Dr. Jacobs, I had a kidney stone. I haven't went to the restroom in three days. And when you said that the angel's moving something, I could feel something moving. Down. I went out the men's rooms to the left. I went to the bathroom and passed that stone. I have no pain. <laughs> You can either go to a urologist or get in one of my meetings if you got kidneys. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that, but that, I'm telling you, you probably don't think you probably never heard that before, unless there's somebody else that can do that. But that angel got that stone out of his body supernaturally, and I, I've heard that kidney stones are very, very intensely painful. So he got healed, and his back got healed too, as far as I know. Yeah. And then I was at Pastor Keith's church. I don't know when that was, back in your old building. 
uh, was 80 people at church service one night, and I was staying downtown at a hotel, and I, and I don't have visions every day. Let me explain something. And when I get into talking about visions, I'm 72. The first vision I had, I was five. That's 67 years ago. And I don't have them all written out, but I didn't all have those notes with me now. But I have other visions too. But the Lord started dealing with me when I turned 60. He wanted me to share some of my visions with the body of Christ. And I said, I'd rather not do that. And I'll wait and tell you the rest of the story later. Said, I got to move on. <laughs> so I came to, I was downtown. I was praying. I had a, a suite, so I had two rooms. If my wife wanted to take a nap or watch TV, she could stay over there and I could stay in the other part. And I had a vision. I saw an automobile accident. I didn't know if it was male or female. I know it was human. And I saw this person tossed around in that car. And normally, probably one of the strongest gifts of spirit that operate through me is a word of knowledge. But normally, it's just a word of knowledge. Like, you got a bad left ankle. you got a vertebrae is number five from the top down or whatever. And that's what it is. But with this person, I said, you were injured this, in this part of your body, this part of your body, this, this, and this. Five things. Who's that? But when I got there to preach that night, I said, who's that? A lady over here kind of raised her hand. I think I startled her because she started to talk and she started to stutter. Well, well, well. And then she stopped and said, well, I'm a visitor here and I've never been to this church in my life. I said, well, is what I said accurate? Yes, sir, to the T. I said, well, now I don't know if she's a heathen, a Lutheran, a Catholic, a Pentecostal, <laughs> whatever. And so I said, well, ma'am, this is the way God would use me. I'd just lay hands on your head. I said that for two reasons, because some of the parts were parts I shouldn't have been involved with anyway. But I just lay hands on her head. You come up here, and, I'll lay, and the power of God will go into your body and start straightening all that out in your body. She said, okay. So she came up. She stood about six feet from me. Just to make sure she's following me, I said, now, I'm going to walk over to you in just a minute. I'm going to lay hands on your head and release the power, and it'll go into your body and start working. Okay. I took a step. The Lord said, hold it. So you want to walk by faith? Here you go. He said, tell her one of the healing angels working with you is going to handle it personally. So I said to her, well, the Lord told me not to lay hands on you. Not I do have a healing endowment, but one of the angels who work with me in the healing ministry is going to take care of that. So just lift your hands up. She's about this far away from me. I was over at the pulpit. Lift your hands up. And then when she got them up, she started going back like this until her head was down to her rear end. I mean, you, you, it, I saw it. He saw it. Past, there was 80 people in that meeting. You can't see how that spine would not snap. I, I mean, I was in all just like everybody else. So she goes so far, She didn't hit the ground, of course, but it wasn't that low. But I mean, her spine was like that. <laughs> and he brought her up forward. Then he turned one way and then the other way. I'm not going to turn that far. I don't have to go to a chiropractor. And, <laughs> And at the end, she put her hands up, or he grabbed them, I don't know. And then he jerked her, hooked her up on her tiptoes like a ballerina and set her down. It took about 80 seconds. She was totally healed. Wow. All right. <laughs> yeah, hallelujah. Now, I think your pastor asked me this question yesterday. It could have been today, but I think it was yesterday. We were talking about angels and and. Uh, and our part with them. And all I know is, to tell, I told him this one story, I could tell several, but I will tell a bunch as we get on into this. And I'm not trying to just give you uh, things that I didn't see. I didn't read that in somebody's book. I just studied my Bible. What a unique way to do it. <laughs> now you think I'm teasing you, but you don't know me well. I used to know me. But I mean, I've read a hundred books on angels and I shredded 97 of them. And now the other three, want my book's one of them. And I really didn't even go that far in my book. But anyway, I'm just, that because it's just fluff. Put a nice wrapper on something, people will buy it, think they're going to change the world overnight. They don't even know what they're doing. <laughs> even if you read the book and believed it, it's not, it's, not, it's not even solid on the Word. So I was telling Pastor Jay about it. I said, I know one thing, it seems like the angels work with me. I usually have to make the first move. And I was telling about I was in Manzanillo, Mexico about uh, mm, 12 years maybe ago. I don't remember exactly. I've been in that city a lot, I mean, over my lifetime to pre preach for a lady preacher there named Maria Rancun. And I was teaching on angels, and I had a word of knowledge about hearts, physical hearts. And so eight people came, eight or nine. I started with this guy right here. I laid my hands on his head, but when I laid hands on his head, this angel came around this side just like the one that took care of the kidney stone. But he put his whole hand in his chest, the man's chest up to about there. And he started, from my eyes, it looked like he's opening a safe. 
you know, he goes click, click. It didn't make that sound, but it looked like he was, but I knew better he was fixing something. Yeah. I took my hand, and I said, right, I took my hand off. He, he did put his arm in his chest until I put my hand on his head. And when I took my hand out, he put his arm out. We went to the next was a lady, laid hands on her head, asked God either to give her a new heart or fix the one she has, because he's got parts. Yeah. God's got parts. Yeah. And so the same thing happened. All eight or nine of them, I don't remember about that many. And when I got done, the lady ran over to me. Did you see that angel put his hand in my chest? What she saying? Did you see that angel put a, his hand in my chest? I said, did you see an angel put his hand in your chest? I just seen a sheet really talking. Yes, I did. I said, I did too. What happened when you took it out? All my symptoms left me. Amen. I had symptoms when I got in line. Lord. I have a bad heart. And it's, oh, I had several things wrong. And see, what I'm saying is now I've prayed for them too. I laid, released my faith, but then the angels assisted me in getting that done too. Yeah. Praise God. All right, let me see here. If I can. So we've had that happen a lot in my life and different things like that. I had a lady in my church, a lady and her husband. They, were, they weren't old at all. They were only 40-something. But they thought they were old. I don't know. People get different things in their head. You know, different generations get married at 16, 17, 18. Some of them never get married anymore. Or they marry the wrong person. Three times in a row. I can't get it. But <laughs> I'm just teasing you. If you've been married and divorced and married somebody, just, just deal with yourself. Don't keep doing that. <laughs> And because you leave a lot of debris in the way when you do that. With, and yourself, you just mess yourself up. So. What was I saying? Oh, a lady in my church, a lady and a man who came to see me, make an appointment, came in my office, said, we want to have a baby. I said, okay. And then she said, went on to say, well, my husband's been to a urologist and I've been to a gynecologist. And both the doctors said, we can't do that. We're not fit. Our parts are not working right. And I said, well, have you thought about adoption? Yeah, we thought about it, but we don't like that idea. We're not against children. We want our own children. I said, well, I believe where you get your own children if you want. Yeah. I laid hands on their head, prayed for them in my office. They kept trying. They'd been trying for five years already. And I think they were in their early 40s. So nothing happened for several months, you know, because they would report to me. I didn't ask them to, but they'd come say, hey, we're still trying. And I said, faith of that works is dead, so go ahead. <laughs> I don't know if you're ready for me tonight. <laughs> So one, one Sunday I was at, uh, up preaching at the church and I had a word about depression. I had a lot of people get healed of depression in my ministry, a lot of people. And some people are just uh, really have some mental issues and some people are just practically almost insane. But anyway, I'm just telling you what, and I had a word about depression and I don't have the whole altar filled up that day in my own church where, where I was pastor, where my son pastors now. And she was in the line down here. I barely touched her head like this. There's a step here, touched her head. And she, I mean, this happened just this quick. I mean, I took longer to walk to it than I could have told you. She was 15 feet away, looked like she, I didn't see her feet move. People on the front row looked at her and looked at me and went, like, what is going on here? A wind hit her and sucked her back like she was on a rubber band, all I can tell you. I didn't see her feet moving. She just went, shoop, and she's 15 feet away from me. It was just one of those moments where you went, God is in this place. <laughs> And so I, I kept looking at her. She had her hands up. And I said, Patty, that angel sit there on your right. He's putting his arm inside of you down there and he's fixing something. That's all I said. The next month she was pregnant. So they know how to fix things. Just any kind of thing that you might need fixed. Okay. Let's go over here to Hebrews and uh, look at something here. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. Before I start reading, let me say something about Hebrews. Uh, probably Hebrews is probably just about my fav favorite book of the Bible. Is I stick with Hebrews tightly because it's got so much information about everything. But it's a contrast, the whole book of Hebrews, chapter 1 and chapter part of chapter 2 is a contrast between the angels and Jesus. And he's, he's God. But he mentions the angels in verse 13, and he's not talking to the angels. He says this, but to which of the angels said he at any time, he didn't say this, but he's given a contrast here, sit on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. He said that to Jesus. And secondly, and as important as that is, he's saying that to us because we're joint heirs with Jesus. You are not a sub heir. I think you, if I told you to say you're a joiner, you could say it, but in your brain, you're not thinking you're that. You're thinking you're less than him. 
I'm going to go out on a limb here with you. I think you're only second church I told this to. I had a vision not too long ago, and I saw the, a, seat, a chair at the right hand of God, and his, his head was there. Jesus' head was there. He said, do you think that looks right? I said, absolutely not. Where's your body? He says, it's with me. I told you that in the Bible. That's right. So that's not a complete picture then of you without your body. He just had his head sitting in the chair. I'm not a macabre person. I don't watch horror movies. I don't watch people chopping up each other either. Just so you know what I'm thinking. That'll make a weirdo out of you. And what God was showing me, I've been saying this for 25 years, you're not a sub anything, you're a join here. And if that don't put you over, honey, I don't have another thing to give you for that. I don't have a B plan. <laughs> now that's it. But the problem is sometimes we don't renew our mind to that and we think about it, then we know all of our weaknesses because you're living with yourself. All of us do that. And you've got to get around that and you, you, get, you begin to see yourself after Christ and in His image and that you're connected to Him. And you're a joint heir with him. Like me and my wife, she just went to heaven last year, but we had a joint bank account. I didn't have a separate one. She have, I don't know what's wrong. That's why people get divorced sometimes over money. But we had a joint account. It means that I could go to the bank and take all the money out and I could put money in and she could do the same thing. Not one of us was over each other in that realm. She was smarter than me in doing accounting and I let her handle that because she was just smart. I, I needed her help. <laughs> anyway. So are you with me? Okay. So he says this to Jesus is who he's really talking to. He's given a comparison. He didn't say that to an angel. You know, angels in this dispensation are servants to us, me and you. Not just your pastors. Not just your grandpa. Not like some rogue person like me who wrote a book about it and believes in it. But Okay, so now he turns back into the angels where he says, are they, referring back to the comment, the angels. Are they, the angels, are they not all ministering spirits? I like to say this, in the fivefold ministry, uh, you have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and you have ministry of helps. And if you're not in those things, you're not in Christ. <laughs> and so it's diverse. We got people at the sound booth and somebody's, uh, you know, filming here and there and you know, and the, the team was up playing, the musicians were playing and all that. It takes a lot of components to make a good church. <clears throat> but I wanted to show you they're all ministering spirits. Now, what I say it this way is the easier way to say it, I think. Every angel has a job description. And some of them only do one thing, and some of them do a multitude of things. I guess one angel works with me since 208. God told me to get up early and pray one morning. I got up, went to my chair in the living room. I began praying in tongues for about 50 minutes, and I get quiet. That's just what I do. Now, I have prayed as long as four or five hours, but I don't do that every day. And so I'm sitting there waiting for him to speak to me because I've, he said to get up and pray. He didn't tell me what to pray about, so I just prayed in the Spirit. He said, Michael, I'm giving you a new anointing. A new anointing. I said, what about? He said, on breathing conditions with people, COPD, asthma, uh, lung cancer, anything associated with uh, your lungs and your breathing. I said, okay, he didn't mention anything about an angel then either. Okay, so when that came over the next time I was preaching and I had that word, I said, if you have any lung conditions, get up here. And throughout the time he told me that since 208, I've had a lady get two, a man get two new lungs. I had a lady that had surgery for three quarters of one lung t taken out for, from cancer. And she showed up just a few days after that to be in my meeting in, in California with the Simons. You, Pastor Debbie, has she been here? Pastor Debbie and Johnny? Yeah. And uh, he, she went right back to the doctor in six weeks. He took x-ray. He said, I don't understand. I cut out three quarters of that lung. You had a brand new lung in there. Not the one I worked on. But, but in that case, I didn't see this angel. But he showed up in my meeting in Costa Rica that year later to 208. <coughs> I was preaching down there on angels. You always preach on angels? Well, let me say it to you this way. Most people don't know anything about angels. And about half or three quarters of what they've been told is an error or it's, it's not right. And so, you know, I, I feel like that's a good thing for me to teach since I've devoted 40 some years of my life to t teach it and study it. I, I'll preach it. I mean, when I'm pastor, you've got to preach everything. How to think, how to talk, how to get along in your marriage, how to raise kids, how to handle your money, how to be healthy. This, I mean, it goes on and on. It's, you know, I'm not a pastor anymore, and I'm not bellyaching about it. I'm just saying, when you're a pastor, you have to train your people in every day. And some of them are older and middle-aged and younger, and some of them got little babies. Some of them got, uh, you know, 
teenagers and yeah. there's all kinds of stuff you have to learn to do. Yeah. They're going to be a good parent. <laughs> so, okay. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So anyway, I was in Costa Rica preaching and I preached and I preached on angels. And at the end of the service, I said, if you have any breathing problems come up and a lady said, she told me personally, she talked to me. I said, uh, yes, ma'am. She said, I've had lung problems my whole life. I'm 80 years old. I said, well, God's going to fix you today. And I laid hands on her. And this angel showed up. I'm going to tell about him. This is all he does is lungs. And he, and, and while I got my hands on her, he came up and he's got a laser that comes out of this finger. You know, you can go to hell for lying. Just so you know, I know what I'm talking about. I wouldn't be saying that if I didn't see it. And he just went across her lungs. And he, when he does that, whoever they are, their lungs are discolored. Sometimes, one time they were black or gray or dark gray or light gray or some other color than normal. And he takes that laser and runs it across the chest of the person. And it removes all that. So this angel showed up. First time I'd ever seen him. And he had this finger out. And he just stuck it there. And he went. Ch -ch 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 -ch. She fell out. And then this young boy was, came up. He'd been over here the whole time I was preaching. Was not in the church, but it didn't matter. He was out of those uh, people's view. But I heard him over here because this is the way he breathed, and I'm not making fun. Yeah. It's the way he breathes. Yeah. <sighs> 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 Sound like a machine. Right. And that went on the whole time I preached for an hour. Yeah. And he got in the prayer line, and <laughs> I said, you're going to get it today. I laid hands on his head. <laughs> that angel just skipped over to him and did the same thing. But he did something else to him. He didn't do that as much as he straightened out his bone structure. I didn't know that at the time. But, and then he's on the ground. He's out, and I'm done because I don't have anything else to do. So I just turned to the pastor that invited me. I said, I'm through, sir, if you want to take over. And he said, sure. So I wasn't going to eat with that pastor that day. I was going with some other people back to the hotel to eat and rest because I had service that night. And she came that night, the mother of the boy, and she said, when we got home, Dr. Jacobs, you didn't know this. I said, well, I could hear him breathing funny. I mean, I'm not making fun of that. She said, when we got home, we had a big family, about 10, 15 people, and he's standing in the corner, and he's just breathing. That's what he sound like now. And he said, she said, Jose, what are you doing? He said, Mama, I'm breathing. And she said when he was born, he had problems. The structure inside his lungs pushed the bones together or something, and it gets stuff, and it made his lungs kind of compress, and you feel like he's breathing the last breath he's breathing right then because he's making all this noise. But he's not breathing like that now. <laughs> he was 10 years old. <laughs> I just know it was that angel because I saw that light coming out of his finger. He don't do ankles. He don't do ears. He don't do cheek, teeth. Other angels do sometimes with me. They do a lot of varied things. But this one, he's a single tasker. So he doesn't come to help me with anything else, just with that. All right. Well, let's go back to verse 14. We didn't get through verse 14. I'm not even seeing a clock. Is, there, is that? Okay. All right. I see something back there in red. It says 759. Yeah, that's about it. You know what it means when a preacher looks at his watch? Nothing. <laughs> no, no. Oh, my goodness. I should have brought the little card I got from a little girl in Texas. She really likes me, and her parents were trying to get pregnant for several years, a young couple. They went to, you know, different things of fertility, and I don't know, and they took medicines. And, and so they've been trying for five years, and I prayed with them. They had this little girl. Her name's Addie. And she just, she just loves me. I don't understand it, but she does. And she sent me a little card. I was just there. She said, I love it when you come, Dr. Jacobs. You're my favorite preacher. And you're so funny. And you're a good preacher. I love you. <laughs> so whenever I'm, I have it at the hotel, I was reading it and almost crying today. Oh, man, somebody loves me. <laughs> <laughs> so when I get a lot of criticism, I get that out and say, oh, she loves me. <laughs> She's about eight now, I think. So it says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs? So I like to read it a little different. If you'll give me permission, it's 2000 years old, that writing roughly. And it says, we could read it this way. Are they not all ministering spirits? In other words, they all have a job description. Doesn't, see they're, doesn't say they're all being used, but it says they all have some in them that they could contribute to humanity. All right. And it says, uh, they've been sent forth to minister for those of us who are now the heirs of salvation. We're not going to be, we are. If we're in Christ, we're the, we are the heirs. Amen. All right. And it's just real interesting uh, 
wording here. Now, let me give you a little more information, and I'm going to move off this for a little bit. I have another section I want to get into, and it's important to our study because most people think all the angels live in heaven. That's the wrong answer. I didn't know it either until I figured it out in the Bible. And then I told God, I'm not going to preach it until you give me something over in the, over uh, some more scriptures. And you said two or more. So I'm asking you to give me at least one over in the letters. If you can't do that, I'm not going to preach it. Because I've watched some of these. Okay, I'll back off. Some of these preachers that get you back in Leviticus and you get lost in Leviticus. You're in Leviticus land the rest of your life. You never get to Ephesians. You certainly don't get to Hebrews. Or what you are in Christ, you're still figuring out about Jewish robes and Jewish things. <laughs> Bringing animals to the altar and killing them. Anyway, he, he said, I'll do you one better. I'll give you three more instead of just two. I said, okay, but I'm not there yet. I'll get there tonight, hopefully. If you'll say amen every once in a while, I think you're listening at least. All right, so I did some further study here, verse 14. I went to the Weymouth translation, the New Testament, and he says the angels in his translation are a benefit to us. And the benefit means useful aid or help. The angels, and one, one definition of that word benefit, I think it's from the, the original Noah Webster's dictionary, which is about this thick. It weighs about 80 pounds to lift it. I'm telling you, it's a huge thing. But one of my sons bought me a copy of it because I, I wanted one. I had a little collegiate dictionary, a little red one. But this has got green. It's about that thick. But when you look up stuff in his Noah Webster, he was a Christian. He put, all, he put, if he gave you a definition, he gave you a definition in English. Then he wrote down four or five or six scriptures to show you where that's at. Interesting. So I looked that up, this word ministering here. Are they not all, I'm talking about Weymouth. I don't want to get ahead of myself. So he said they're a useful aid or a help for us. And the Amplified Bible says that they're an assistance to us. Now think about this. You, if a person went through their whole life and they did know that angels is a word and they know how to spell it, but to get it at the end of their life, but they've never had an angelic help in any form or fashion because they didn't ask for it, didn't send them forth to do anything. And guess what? They're not going to do it automatically. Let me, say, let me say, I think you can understand me if I just tell you what I'm thinking. Uh, if God was in charge of all the angels doing what they do, we'd never have any issues. I think he's smart enough to figure that out. He's wanting us to catch up with him because how can two walk together unless they be agreed? And if you don't know what I'm saying, you don't know it yet. I don't know it, everything. So I, I can't walk in uh, agreement with him. Now, he's, this is the way I view it. He's put, um, I'm not a techie guy, but what do you call those uh, in a computer? Uh, a thing you put in, a, not a, it's what's that called? Huh? USB. USB. No, well, well, it may be called that. I don't know. It's like the set of stuff that goes in it to help it do something. Oh, you guys are way out beyond me. <laughs> A system. I'm calling it a system because I don't have. I don't use a computer. But that, that that angel is committed to do. Listen to me. What's in him, according to his system, he has. But you have to be saying things like God says about him to activate that. What I'm saying is, if God's word alone activated them, I would need to be involved. But that's not true. So God's wanting you to catch up, at least to get you to get some general scriptures like Psalm 91 is excellent. I know it's Old Covenant, but man, it covers a lot of stuff for angels and other things, protection particularly. Okay. So, so what I'm saying is you get older and you get ready to go home and the Lord, and this is what I'm thinking because there's going to be tears in heaven. Let's say you had two, uh, did you have two screens up here when I was standing there? I wasn't paying attention. I was just looking at this one, but you have two screens. So God says, okay, Charlie, run this thing on Mr. Jacobs, or he just calls me Michael, really. Those are the angels. They all call me by their first name. All of them that I met so far. And show, show him what he, he had in the earth. Then show him this, what he could have had if he'd have paid attention to the benefits I gave him. <laughs> and that's, that projector's running five times, ten times, a hundred times longer than that. Because I didn't take advantage of anything. Now, when I say take advantage, I don't mean bend God's arm. You're not going to push him around at all. If he didn't provide it, you're not getting it anyway. But if you don't know it's provided, you don't have it either. Or you can hear somebody talk about it and still just not do it, and you still don't get anything. 
I'm just trying to help you think with me. I've been studying this a long time. I don't know everything, but I've asked a lot of questions about this. You know, let me ask you this. Jesus died 2,000 years ago, but I didn't get saved until 1971. I had to do something. I didn't have to die. He already took care of it, but I had to say, come into my life, Jesus. Help me. Oh, I need help. So I had to release my faith in some form or fashion. Let somebody lead me in prayer or just pray myself or you know what I'm saying. All right. So we got all this assistance down here and we're not supposed to. And, and I went back after I read this about Weymouth. It says a benefit. I thought, well, the Bible in Psalm 103, I believe it is. Uh, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless the Lord and forget not all his benefits. Now, it doesn't mention angels in the first part of 103, but you get down to about 19 and 20, it mentions the angels in that same, that same psalm. So they were a benefit in that psalm specifically. So we're going to do without them unless we change our thinking. That's my point. Okay, let me see here what I'm... Let's look back here at the word ministering. I'm just about to move from Hebrews in a minute. Are they not all ministering spirits? It, I went back to that um, Webster's, the big thick one, looked up uh, ministering. And he says it meant to give aid or service to the sick. Now you wouldn't have saw that if I didn't tell you that unless you knew that's what it meant. And then the Greek, the Greek word is uh, 3010 from the Greek New Testament in this verse here, ministering. It says to function publicly as a benefit. So sometimes they show up and they do things with people when I'm, after I minister to them or while I'm in or maybe right after. Different things like that. We, in 1995, remember I told you I shot 15 Wednesday nights in a row on this. Still didn't get through what I knew back then, but did my best. And when, every Wednesday night I'd have a prayer line. I'd sometimes have words of knowledge and I'd say, also come if you need a miracle or I might say, I might have some specifics and then just come if you need any help physically right now or mentally. I tell you, I tell you what I'm thinking. I'm a prophet, but I'm telling you, America and the rest of the world's in a mental health crisis right now. I mean, people are just really strange in their head and messed up. You know, I don't mean that in a complimentary way. I'm just saying that where there's so much distraction. So I was going to tell about uh, tell about something here. Uh, about Kim. She was in my church during that time, 95. I don't know why she came. You know, I just had them come. I didn't have them tell me. I just laid hands on them, pray, be healed, be healed. And if I knew something else, I'd add that in if I had it. But I got back on the, up on the platform behind the pulpit there, and I was looking at everybody, the ones that are still laying there. One girl named Kim, she'd been a part of my church for quite a while. She had a, what do you call it, a drop cloth over her. And I could see her hands out here on a carpet. She's laying down facing that way. And all of a sudden, I saw this activity in the lower abdomen of her body under that cloth. I thought, well, now God's doing something. I don't know what. I don't know if I'm the only one seeing that or what, but that I saw it. So I didn't run to her after service. I think that's rude sometimes. So I just waited a couple of weeks, saw her in the foyer. I said, Kim, can you come here a minute? I said, if it's too personal, you don't need to tell me, but I saw something moving down in here in your body when you had drop cloth on you, you had your hands out. Can you tell me what happened about two weeks ago on a Wednesday? Yes, I can. Two angels flew in. As soon as I hit the floor, these two, one was on one side, one on the other. The one on one side reached in and took a bad part out. The one on this side had a new part and stuck it in me. And I questioned her about it just a few years ago. She came to my church to visit for some special. I said, you ever had any problems since then? No, not since 19. When you ministered, the angels came and ministered to me after you laid hands on me. See, again, I did something first. They're not dependent on me, but I, you know, I think you can understand. I'm not bragging about it. I couldn't heal anything if I didn't anoint it. But the angels have been given to me to assist me. When I first started, I didn't know anything about it. I did have, you know, guardian angel, everybody gets. But then as I grew, I began to have other angels assigned to me. Okay. Let's go, let's go back here to Genesis 28. I hope I'm not rambling too much. But just how much I want to try to hit on some of the highlights and praise the Lord. I think maybe I'm going to share. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, in 1983, I went to preach a, a little co a conference at a church. A pastor, my, a friend of mine was pastoring. I was in traveling ministry back then too. And then I went back to pastoring because the Lord had something else for me to do for a season. And so I'm in this church, I'm preaching on angels. And when I came in, I asked the pastor, I said, it's nothing against you, pastor. 
but do you have a place I could go pray a minute where I could just, you know, be by myself? So he said, yeah, go down to the tape room. It's downstairs in that building. I said, okay. And they had taping equipment for, they were on radio and they had a chair and a desk and all rec radio equipment. That's all I can tell you. And I was on my knees praying. I had my hands up like this. And all of a sudden, I mean, and I'm saying this so you understand me. I had no, what do you call that? Insight into the fact I'm about ready to leave my body. <laughs> and so I started coming out of my body and I'm floating. That's the only way I could describe it. And I'm about eight feet away from where I was just kneeling. I look back and there I am. There's my body. I'm over here. And all of a sudden there's an angel holding this arm up, an angel holding that arm. I didn't even bother to stop and ask God about that at that moment. Later when I got more together in what had happened, I said, what was with the two angels? He said, well, you know, the Bible says in James, uh, the spirit, uh, the body without the spirit's dead. You, you couldn't made it. You have to have something keeping you alive when you're away from your body because you're not in there anymore. And I said, okay. And then he did it again another time in one of the visions in 99. That was in 83. But anyway, this is what happened. So I'm floating and I end up in a big room. With this sanctuary, it'd probably be, maybe if you flip that wall, that wall, flip the whole building over one more time and from the front to the back, maybe two times that way. And I didn't count them. So I'm telling you that up front. But I would say there was a thousand angels in this room. It's a huge room and they were, they were everywhere. And I was just in awe that I was seeing this. And, I, and I, I didn't say a word. I'm just experiencing it. But I'm going to pretend like that I'm kneeling facing this way and all the angels are back this way. And the one angel looked at me and said, Michael, you know, I always call me Michael and they're not all the same angel. Some of, the, some, some of them that work with me constantly, they are with me more than others. But anyway, he said, Michael, and he went like this, we're excited you're teaching about us for we've desired to be involved in the body of Christ and they won't let us. And then all of a sudden, shoof, I found myself leaving that room, kind of floating backwards. I came back and went through my mouth, came down into my body like you put on a boot or a glove. And uh, I'm, in, I'm inside my body again, so I'm, oh my goodness. And somebody said, did you tell the people what you saw? That Heavens, no. <laughs> I know you'd have had it all figured out in two minutes, wouldn't you? <laughs> That's what you all think. And maybe some of you could have. I didn't. I've never figured it out any, any time that fast. In two minutes. I meditated on those last four words though for four months because that disturbed me. That I was seeing these magnificent creatures that are capable of doing things. You, you know, I could just barely touch on the highlights of some things that I've seen. They could do all kinds of stuff. And they were eager. They weren't dressed in like a jogging outfit. I don't mean, I'm not making fun. But there was something on their manner of looking at me and their eagerness, uh, boldness, something. Let us go. We're ready to help you. And that bothered me that that angel said they won't let us. So this is what happened to me after thinking about that for four months. Like a revelation hit me down here. It's like a bomb went off. And then I said to myself out loud, I was by myself. Thank God or people think I'm talking to myself. Then I must have authority I don't know anything about. And it wasn't that I didn't have any authority. I was already casting out devils out of people and stuff since 78. So, but I thought I must have authority. I don't understand fully. And the whole body of Christ must have the same problem because they indicate we're holding them back. Yeah. Yeah. So again, going to my thought that God's already charged his angels, but I have to catch up with him. And I understood from that expression from that one angel, I, I would say it this way. They're not emotional like us. Thank God. N I've never had an angel talk back to me. Never. And I shut the devils up when they try to talk through the people's mouth. I say, you shut up and come out. Anyway, but I just think that's amazing. They're not like us. They're, they're not emotional. They do have joy. And they have some expression. What I want to say is that angel, there was an element of frustration in his voice that he was putting off to me when he said they won't let us. And he didn't say so help me, but it marked my life so much. I, I've been doing this teaching on this since 83, that particular vision. Hallelujah. Okay. Yeah, praise God. I'm excited, but I know you are too. So always remember, they're excited that I'm teaching about them. Even after all these years, that was 1983. That's a little ways back. And sometimes they will come, sometimes when I'm uh, standing on the front row, or sometimes when I'm in the hotel, or they'll say, we're, we're, we're going to help you tonight. And I say, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. I'm going to talk about you. But I don't have to see them to believe they're there because I know they're there. You know, and I don't have time to teach you that tonight, but there, well, I will in just a second out of this passage, a portion of it. Angels go to church. 
they really like church. I mean, you know, sometimes your congregations, maybe 80% of them like church, and I'm not sure about the other 20, but it, I'm just kind of teasing you a minute. You know I'm right, though. I know you know that. <laughs> yeah, some of you have had best friends, and they're not even here anymore. When you're in a good church, stay put. Just stay put. <laughs> they could not teach things out of you and put things in you. You know what I mean? Correct things. All right. <laughs> all right. I want to show you this. This is really interesting here. I try to teach this part here all pertains to angels being in this planet. See, I didn't even know that. I don't know where I got some of my ideas. I, I know that you wouldn't admit it, but some of you got some funny ideas about angels. My mother, she was a real prayer warrior when I was younger. And somebody sent her a picture of angels picking guitars and eating grapes in heaven. And I had that image in me for <laughs> 30 years, I bet, before I figured this out. I don't ever seen them made a grape, and I don't know that they play guitars. They play trumpets. I know that from the Book of Revelation. They maybe play something I don't know about. But see, you're 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 geared that way, and your grandma probably has a, a what, what do you call those cabinets with the little knickknacks, and she's got little I call them preschool looking babies, like they're beer bellies, and they're just about that tall, and they got curly hair, and they got a little rubber dart boing. Uh, I'm going to tell you this: if you ever see an angel in his normal uh, element is not stepping over into this natural. I've had them do that to me too, but in their normal sphere of influence where they exist, you're going to have to have faith or huggies. <laughs> and they're, they're not trying to be a bad guy that's an actor that's a bad guy all the time on TV. That's not, but they're intimidating. There's just something about them. They're just intimidating. Yeah. And that's why the Bible says fear not. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, I better get on with this. Okay, I'm in, I'm in Genesis 28, and look at verse 12 here. And he dreamed, this is Jacob. Remember I said you'd have to have a dream, a vision, or operate in discerning of spirits. That's the only three ways I know you could look into the spirit realm. If, you could, if God would let us all see that tonight, all the angels, your personal angel, and if you have additional angels, I do for my ministry. I'm not bragging, I didn't ask for any of them. But I used to teach people <laughs> when I was younger about this, because I felt like people weren't using them. So I said, if you leave them down there two more weeks at the unemployment office, I'm taking them. Because I know how to put them to work. <laughs> I was seasoned, and my ministry started growing concerning angels. All right. So Jacob, he dreamed a dream. Behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. I read that just like he heard me read it. But one day God started dealing with me. I was just me and him. He said, you read that perfectly, but you don't get it perfectly. I, I said, so what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to read it again out loud to yourself and me. And so I read it out loud again to him. And he said, you still don't have it. You got, in your mind, this is the way I was thinking. I'll cut to the chase a little bit. I read it seven times before I figured it out. Now, I know sometimes you, we think that we're really getting it. And then when God shows us, you go, oh, man, what was I thinking? Well, you weren't thinking, Michael. You were reading it right, but you weren't understanding. I was thinking God cut a hole out of heaven, out of the clouds, and threw over a rope ladder, like a pirate movie or something. And the, the end of it would tickle the grass. And the angels would come down, then they'd go back up. But that's total opposite of what this says. The ladder was set up on the earth, not in heaven. And secondly, more importantly, they went up and came back, because this is where they live. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Hattaball, he, some of you know who he is probably, and, and then I've got a spiritual son who lives in Mexico City. Those men come up and visit me, but they don't live with me. They just come up for a season or a week or maybe, uh, you know, a couple of days. Then they go back where they live because that's where they live. So I said to the Lord, this is what I said when I finally got it after seven times. I said, I see exactly what you're saying, but here's my problem. Not with you, but I'm not going to preach this one, on one verse because I know better than that. Your Bible says in the mouth of two or more witnesses, you would prove it. So if this is really you talking to me, and I think it is, you're going to have to give me some other references in the other places in the Bible where it will compare to this and give me the same information or something similar to this. Because I'm not going to get stuck in the book of Genesis. Now, I will tell you this. When I read the book of Genesis over and over a couple of years ago, I found out the, the people in the book of Genesis know more about angels personally than most churches I've been to in my lifetime, they, they excel us, I mean, a hundred times over. 
I don't know how they did that, but they knew about them. They knew they were angels. They knew how to communicate with them. They knew how to, they helped them. But I said, and we're in a new covenant. We're supposed to be in a better revelation with better promises. And, and sometimes when I'm talking and telling you stuff like that, I think some people think I'm living in Disneyland. I'm not living in, I'm living in Bible land. <laughs> Trying my best to live in Bible land. You know, the Bible does say somewhere in 1 John, and there's other places similar, uh, you, you live your life, those that are begotten of God, in such a way that the evil one cannot touch you. Amen. You're kind of like Dorothy in the ruby red slippers. <laughs> and there's no such thing as a good witch, but Glinda was the good witch in that movie. She said, she's supposed to be important, don't get away from him. <laughs> Bye-bye. She was in her little bubble, flies away. You do remember that story, don't you? <laughs> all right. I mean, there's a whole sermon in Wizard of Oz. There's all kinds of stuff in it. I do, I do, I do believe. Remember the lion? He's crying. I do. I think Addie was right. I'm funny. <laughs> But I tell you, that's not my personality. I'm not a jokey type funny guy. I'm never going to get up and tell you a joke to start a sermon. That's just not me. But I think I've been pretty funny today anyway. <laughs> okay, let's go down. I'm still in uh, Genesis 28, but I want to show you a little something else there. Verse uh, 16, and Jacob will wake down of his sleep. He's having, a, he's having a, a vision at nighttime. He's having a dream. And he said, surely the Lord's in this place and I knew it not. And, and he was afraid and said, how dreadful. Now that's a poor translation. The really word there is awesome. How awesome is this place? Now watch. And this is none other but the house of God. Which 1 Timothy 3.15 says the house of God is the church. Yeah. Now we know this is old covenant, but Moses was the pastor of the church in the wilderness. By the way, he had an angel that helped him. I haven't even got that far. I'm going to talk to the pastors, you know, about this. One of the other sessions, I'll talk to you about personal angels assigned to you and how to activate them. And then if I have time, I'd like to take maybe two of the lessons possibly and teach about visions. I can't teach them all in one session. It's too much. But anyway, this says, uh, this is none other but the house of God. And this is amazing here. So this, if this dream he's having and the angels are involved in it is happening at church. I have several other scriptures to more go into detail, but this is good to hold you for there. And this is the gate of heaven. In other words, this is the way God put it to me. Church is the only institution that I know anything about in the planet that has a gate through which heavenly things flow through it. Into the community, into the nations, into the cities you live and where you work, and, and the gifts of the Spirit flow through that, and all kinds of stuff. I had revival in my church, 95, 96, 97, part of 98, and we had a big chute, like a big round chute, about 12 feet in diameter, right over in this section of our church. And many people, not just me, other people in the church would look up, and sometimes angels would fly down there and touch different people and go back up, and we had all kinds of miracles happen in that area. It, well, I was in revival. And I'll be honest, I didn't stop and look up every scripture back then because I didn't know how to look up that thing. Jacob had a ladder, I had a chute. <laughs> now, I'm not playing with this. I'm being, and my daughter was one of the girls. There were three girls, all young girls. My daughter was about 13, 14 then. I think I ministered to her and two other girls. They're very committed young ladies, very clean. And I touched them on their head and blessed them. And two and a half hours later, they were still standing there at the altar like this with one hand up. I was there in the meeting. I know what I'm talking about. Two and a half hours, and they were like almost semi-comatose or something. So I told the ushers, just back them up easy, set them in these chairs until they come back. And, you know, God visited them. I tell you, some of you guys who think you can lift weights, you put your arm up for two and a half hours, let your wife time you. You're going to the chiropractor tomorrow because you can't move your elbow. You can't move your shoulder. Help me, honey, help me. <laughs> I don't know what's gotten into me. I'm sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so I said to the Lord, let me repeat this. I said, I will preach it if you give me some additional 
material. So he said, okay. And you know, I, I didn't want to do like Brother Hagin said. Brother Hagin said, the Lord, I don't know anything about that. He said, yeah, there's lots you don't know about. But I said that to the Lord about this. If there's that many scriptures, I don't know about it. He said, that's evidence you don't know about it. There's a whole lot you don't know about yet, Michael. I said, yeah, forgive me for being stupid. So he turned, said to John, well, chapter one, you learning with me? Yes. And I want to do that to you for several reasons. One is for yourself, but how about your kids? Because if you think your kids, children, and angels are in heaven, you're not thinking right. You see, in order for an angel to protect you, and they can't be but in one place at one time. Now, that's not true of God. He's everywhere. But the angels are in one physical, um, spiritual body, but they can't be in two places at the same time. So they, they, in order for your children to be protected, the angels have to be with them. And when I want you, when you're praying over your children, you know, when my kids were little, they did what I told them to do. And even as I got older, pretty much, but they tried me a few times. But my point is, you know, I always released the angels to go with them and minister to them and keep them safe, even though I didn't know what they were doing all the time. There was a few times I told them, don't do this because the Lord's going to tell me, and I'm really going to get on you if you violate what I told you not to do. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you my hallmark, hallmark, hallmark story. This is a great story. There was a little girl in my church started showing up, a teenager. She's real cute. She told about six boys she loved them, my son being one of them. So she shows up at Christmas time. It's snowing like a hallmark picture. She knocks on the door. I go to the door. I said, yeah, can I help you? She said, well, I thought I was going to come in. I said, did somebody call you from my house and invite you? No. I said, then get in your little car and just take off because you're not coming in. Good night. Shut the door on her. It's snowing. It's like Hallmark moment. She didn't even have a scarf on. <laughs> do you really do? I really, and then I went upstairs to my son. I said, don't have nothing to do with this girl. She's not right. You follow me, son? Do you know what I'm talking about? I mean, stay away from her. She's going to be dangerous to you. And then one time my daughter came home from school and said, I like so-and-so. And I said, well, I don't like so-and-so. You better not be fooling with him at all. I will be very uh, angry with you if you too, try to fool me. And she dropped him. See, I wasn't just able to produce children. I tried to father them. <laughs> not bragging, but just I did my part. My wife was, uh, she was strong too, for sure. Okay, I'm sorry, I've taken a lot of rabbits. I think we got them all. all <laughs> How you doing, Pastor? <laughs> Good. Uh, John 151, and this Jesus talking here, he said to them, Verily, verily, and really the way to tra translate very, very, it's like pay attention to this is important. I say unto you, hereafter you shall see heaven open. In my personal opinion, I'll have to wait to another service to talk about it. Heaven can be different things depending on what it's saying in the context. It could be just the realm of the spirits open. But anyway, and the angels of God, now watch this, ascending and descending, same terminology, upon the Son of Man. He puts himself in a class of man because Hebrews 2 says he emptied himself of his heavenly uh, authority and became a man. So here he's not only identifying as a man, but he's identifying us with the angels ascending and descending, helping us in the earth. And I don't get offended, but you women are a man with a womb. That's, that's it. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not being vulgar. I hope I didn't offend you. I'm just talking. You're of the race. If a tiger ran through here, you wouldn't check his gender. You'd just say, there's a tiger. <laughs> Isn't that right? Gosh. That ought to be a simple... <laughs> Oh, man. Now you guys are laughing. Good. <laughs> okay, so there's number two verses that he gave me. And to go back to Zechariah, and Zechariah was a man who had a lot of visions. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm not offensive to anybody. That's not my intent. I just try to figure out things and ask questions. Like I said before, I ask a lot of questions. So Zechariah here, now it reminds me of Brother Hagin. We start in verse 7. Let's just do that. I've just got one more scripture after this, and then I'm, I'm going to minister to some people. Uh, Zechariah chapter 1, verse 7. Under the 4 and 20th day of the 11th month, which is the month Sebat in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto, unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet, saying, it reminds me of McKinney, Texas. 
Remember when Brother Hagin would say, I lived in such and such a place in McKinney, Texas. And, he, and then when at one time he was up to the courthouse and he takes you around the whole city. That's so-and-so, that's the postmaster's house, that's this, that's, that's a dress shop for ladies, this is Walgreens or whatever. And he said, verse 8, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse. He stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behind him were there red horses speckled in white. Then said I, O my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show you what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk through and throw through the earth. Now this is telling us something that goes back all the way, goes into the book of Hebrews, because it said they've been sent. So God sent them, but also we send them too. I haven't got to that point. We won't talk about it tonight. It's too, too involved. But I wanted, I knew there was something more in verse 10. You know when God stops you on something and says there's something more, you need to figure it out. So I got out other translations, and this is um, verse 10. I'm just talking about verse 10. Okay, Zachariah's having a vision. The angel's talking to him. And he sees these other angelic beings on horses, which they ride horses and chariots and all that stuff too. We don't have time to go to all those references. But in verse 10, another translation says, they patrol the earth, the angels patrol the earth, and they maintain security. Now, I know that, you know, I'm th just talking now, when I get up in the morning, I say, Father, I thank you for the angels today. They have charge over me and so forth to keep me well and safe and from all harm in Jesus' name. I just say that out of my mouth because they're activated. And by the way, angels don't have to sleep. I watched a special on Secret Service recently. It was really interesting. But they have to go to bed sometime. And then the third shift comes on or however they break that down to, to watch our president. And they always have to be with him if they're going to protect him. So the angels patrol the earth and they maintain security. And here's another translation of something, something else. It says they do recon missions. They do security work and they combat if they need to. They can take care of things if they need to. Okay. We learned anything? I got one last scripture that I think it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Let me find that myself. 1 Corinthians 4. And this is the one I said, Lord, there's got to, you've got to give me one in the, in the new covenant in the church of the church. And he said, I can do that. And I said, well, praise God. <laughs> I'd read this over and over, but I'd never seen it from that perspective. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4 and 9. I think that God has set forth us the apostles or we could call them the ministry but they were apostles of the fivefold you know those kind of people could be a woman or a man last as it were appointed to death for we are made now notice this we're not going to be we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men now the word spectacle here I have a Cambridge Bible in the footnote it says uh it says spectacle, GR, and they tell me that word means theater, but, but because I don't always trust all the subtitles, I went to my Greek New Testament and looked it up, and the word for spectacle is theater. So let me say it this way. What do you do when you go to your children's play at Christmas? You sit and you look and you listen. What do you do if you go to a movie? I know there's not much fit to watch, but if you do watch one, you sit and you look and you listen. What do you do if you go to the Philharmonic or an orchestra or some big production somebody does? You look and you listen. That's the two main things you do. But this is telling us not only is the world looking at you and other people, men and women are looking at you, but angels, they're listening and they're looking. Just like tonight, they've been in here with me all night. And they're looking and they're listening for what I'm saying so they could do something for us. I'll get more further into that on the visions part and we'll, we'll do some other things minister. I want you to see that clearly. You have become a theater whatever you're living out and saying and talking and thing in, in the flesh. You're living that out and the angels are listening for you to say something they can do. That's, the title of my book is Angels on Earth. They're waiting on you. It's a pun on words like they're not just waiting on you like a waiter. They do that too. That's their function but they also are Waiting, if you're going to say something they can use or they can't use. I'm going to just say it plain out to you. You have more authority than you ever dreamed. And I, and I didn't say God, I said you. Of course God has authority, He's the Creator. But He puts certain guidelines in the Bible, you can't violate it no matter what He is. This is why it runs down. And I always say this, that spirit world, I've been familiar with it now for a long time. And I've walked in it more in the last 25 years than ever. 
It's a very highly regulated world. It's not like people in our way we live. You know, I don't mean immoral. I'm talking about everything is tight in that other world. Nothing's happened by accident out there in the spirit world. You have to leave a door open. If, uh, you know, you have to be careful to shut all the doors. What I want to say, so devils don't get a hold of you. I was praying for a lady in my church one time. This is 1979. And I commanded the devil come out, and he came out. And he walked over about three feet. He turned around, and looked at me, looked at her. He walked right back into her. I call her. I just call her Mary. I said, Mary, you got a problem. She said, What do you mean by that, Pastor? I said, I saw that spirit leave when I commanded him to come out, but he only walked three feet away and he walked right back into you. You left the door open. What is it? No, I don't have it. Either you're going to tell me the truth or go on home because I haven't got time to fool with you. I'm your pastor, but I got four or five people waiting for me to pray for him. And I wouldn't even be dealing with it if he hadn't showed me that. But he went right back into you. Well, you think it could be my husband? I don't know. Why don't you tell me? What do you mean? What do I think it would be your husband? What's he doing to you? doing something terrible to you? No. Well, then what's the problem? Well, I resent him. I said, you need to figure that out, lady, because either you just don't want me to fool with this or you just take your devil and go on home because he's in you now. But you left the door open for him to get back in. You can't live in unforgiveness, beloved. Let me say this. You're going to, the tormentors are going to come after you. That's what Jesus said. I didn't say it. He said it. Matthew, I think it's 19 or something, the 19th chapter. You can't live in, unre in unforgiveness, resentment, bitterness, anger. I mean, the devil will take your lunch. He'll just take everything from you. I didn't say people deserve to be forgiven, but neither did I. And I took it because Jesus was offering it. So I just made my mind up about 15 years ago. I'm going to forgive everybody in my past, present, and future. Because I just know how humans are, and they're going to irritate me somewhere down through here. <laughs> and I just make my mind up. I'm not going to get resentful and hateful and be a mean person. I'm not going to be a hater. Okay. Well, I, well, it's it's almost nine o'clock. Well, it's eight thirty-eight on the back wall. That's what I got too. <laughs> you can stand up for a minute, and I'm gonna I'm gonna say something, and I'm gonna pray for you if you need it. Thank you. Somebody could take that for me and move it if you would. I wanted to pray for anybody with any bone issues tonight. You have a bad spine. You have, somebody's here. Somebody, maybe several somebody's have a bad issue with your neck. So if you have any bone issues like arthritis or any of the itises, I'm not trying to be funny. I have anointing for that to get that out of your system. Because if it's in there, it'll, it'll just continue to bring more problems. I'm talking about your bones. I'm talking about your bones right now. You have either back or knees or joint problems. You have joint problems. I'll pray for that. We'll lay hands on you in just a minute. Yep. The ushers will put you wherever you need to be, and I'm going to lay my hands on you. Thank you for responding. You say, what about this? If this is a bone you're talking about, I'm talking about the anointing to deal with that. <laughs> then it'll get it out of your... And what I do pray, too, when I lay hands on you, I believe for the anointing of the fire of God to go into those calcium deposits in your joints, which causes them to be less mobile whatever it's your hip or ankle or knee you know shoulders whatever and it burns out that calcium deposits and you'll begin to function better too okay I'm going to start with this lady in the yellow here be healed in the name of Jesus be healed pastor in the name of Jesus be healed in the name of Jesus in your bones be healed in your bones that's it right there be healed in your bones pastor be healed in your bones sir be healed in your bones be healed in your bones it's working on you be healed in your bones, sir. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I appreciate you responding to me. Hallelujah. Be healed. In, oh, that's it right there. Take that in your bones. Let that saturate you. Be, be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your bones in Jesus' name. Pray for the fire of God to burn out calcium deposits wherever they are and cause the mobility to come back to them. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your bones, young man. That's it, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. I command all the pain to go. Leave you in the name of Jesus. Command all those bones to straighten up, straighten out, in Jesus' name. Praise God. Hallelujah. Come back for you in a minute. Hallelujah. Be healed. Oh, that's it right there. Take that in your bones. 
Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Have anybody else for bone issues? Oh, I see. They're still come coming. Okay. Thank you. Wow. Now I see why God told me about that with the bones. Okay. And be healed in your bones. That's it. Let it go in you. Saturation time's coming on you. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your bones, sir, in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Father. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Anointing went in you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And you're going to recover. The Lord said to tell you that. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your bones. Oh my goodness. Praise God. Hallelujah. All right. Praise God. Hey, what happened to you? Can you tell me kind of? Well, I have a degenerative muscle disease. Okay. But I also have lupus. Okay, lupus. In my joints. Uh huh. Okay. So, I'm going to pray for you. In the name of Jesus, lupus, come out. I break the power of that disease over your body, ma'am. Command it to stop functioning in there and command you to leave her alone. In Jesus' mighty name, I command that to stop. And the things to be reversed, Father, because you're a God of restoration, I will heal them of their wounds and restore their health to them. Jeremiah 30, 17. We thank you for it. We claim it. We believe it. We walk in it. We talk it. We believe in the name of Jesus. Somebody could write that down for this lady right here in the blue coat. Jeremiah 30, 16 and 17 would be good. Be healed in your, oh my goodness, that's it. That anointing hits you. Watch her. Hallelujah. Be healed, oh, in your, in your bones. It's a good receiver. Be healed in your bones. That's it. Be healed in your bones. Be healed in your bones. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you guys got her? Both? Okay, I think she's going down too. Watch her. Be healed in your bones. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Okay, I'm. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Every bit of that to leave you. Be healed in your bones, sir, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Wow, praise God. No wonder we had a word about bones. Hallelujah. Okay. Praise God. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. We thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Hey, praise God. <laughs> yes, sir. Be healed in your bones in the name of Jesus. That's it right there. Praise God. Take all you want. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Somebody here is having, you've been having some severe problem with your teeth or your gums. I don't know, I don't know exactly what I'm seeing, but something, in, and I have anointing for teeth too. Teeth and, uh, and uh, gums. And that, what do you call that little click thing there in your jaw? TMJ? Anybody else have any of those three things? I'm very glad to pray for you. Either your teeth or your gums or that, that little thing that clicks a lot. That's not supposed to click like that all the time. Your team. I had one young girl in my church. She's probably 30 now, but she was younger then. She's a nurse, and she had to go to bed with a mouthful of, uh, I don't know what you call it, some kind of thing to keep her mouth open at night. And I prayed for her, and just a few days later, she went back to the guy that put it in there, and she didn't have it anymore. And he said, you don't need it anymore. It's all been healed up. Be healed in your teeth and your gums and the things. Be healed. Wow. 
be healed in your mouth, your teeth and your gums and that, that little joint in your jaw. Be healed in your mouth. Be healed in your mouth, sir. Hallelujah, teeth and jaw. Be healed in your mouth in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your mouth in the name of Jesus. Well, you're getting the whole nine yards tonight, lady, aren't you? <laughs> Hallelujah. Take all you want. Okay. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. We're still on the teeth thing, right? Okay. Just checking. Make sure. Be healed in your teeth and your gums. In Jesus' name. Be healed in your teeth and your gums. In the name of Jesus. Be healed in your teeth and gums. Be healed in your teeth and gums. In the name of Jesus. Be healed in your teeth and your gums. Be healed in your teeth and your gums. Be healed and watch him. You guys watch him because I don't want anybody falling right here. <laughs> What's up with him? His front tooth started to gray because trauma happened to it. He hit it and so the nerve endings aren't uh -huh. having blood flow. So does he need new teeth? Just for the color to return. Oh, the color to return. We pray for your color of your teeth to return. How'd that be? Good? Yeah, Father, touch him. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. You're a good receiver. Be healed in your teeth. Oh, in your teeth and your gums in the name of Jesus. Be healed in your teeth and your gums. You be healed in your teeth and gums too. Be healed in your teeth and your gums. Be healed in your teeth and gums. Oh, my goodness. Be healed in your teeth and gums. And the little clicker thing. I don't know what you call that. but Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Wow. Be healed in your teeth and your gums. Be healed in your teeth and your gums. Be healed, ma'am, in your teeth and your gums in the name of Jesus. We thank you for it, Father. Thank you for it. Better watch her. Stay with her before she falls by herself. Hallelujah. I lost a lot of weight, so I, I bought new belts, but I can't, I can't keep my pants up very easily. I'm sorry about that. I got to cinch myself up because I lost 26 pounds. <laughs> Hallelujah. What are you doing? Uh, well, I'm just waiting on the Lord to see if he's got anything else. You know, we've got four services. But just, just whatever God puts in my heart, if he adds something to it, I'll speak that out. And if not, I'm going to turn it back to Pastor Jay. Thank you for being patient with me. Amen. And uh, helping me tonight. Thanks for the band up there helping me tonight, too. I appreciate it. Hallelujah. Probably one of these one of these services. I don't know when. I'll probably uh, maybe minister to people who have any kind of, you know, mental issues. I don't want you to be afraid of that term. We got to learn to quit being. It's not all about me or you. It's about God helping us. Amen. Yes, sir. And then if you had a broken foot and I called for a foot injury, you normally would come if I, you needed it. I'm not saying people are all crazy. That I'm not making fun of anybody here. Listen, I know what it is to be mental. Yes. I was a drug addict, and then I was in a, a mental place for a while in the service because I was becoming a drug addict then. And I'm making fun of that, but you just got to get over all the stuff that goes with that. I prayed for a young lady in uh, Long Island, New York, a few, few years ago. I didn't remember praying for her the first year I went. I came back second year, and she stopped me in the sanctuary. For I, you know, I normally I normally leave the sanctuary when I'm done because I'm done. Not because I don't want to talk to anybody. But anyway, she got to me and she said, Dr. Jacobs, you know, you prayed for me last year. I said, did I what I pray about? She said, depression. I'm a single mom. I'm 29. I've been on Prozac for five years. And I said, did you tell me that last year? No. And I didn't tell you to get off of it then, did I? No. I never tell anybody to get off their medication. I say, go back to the doctor and he can tell you because your blood will prove it if it's really real. Anyway, long story short, so... I said, did you write that out on a card? I got little cards on my table people can give a, a testimony with it. And I'd be surprised the number of people when I read stuff that God did for other people, other people get it. So I said to her, well, would you mind writing that down for me? No, I don't mind at all. But you stopped taking Prozac immediately? And I'm an ex-drug addict. Those were newer drugs than I was familiar with. Prozac's an anti-depression medicine, but some of those antidepressant medicines, they're a billion-dollar industry. 
it changes the brain chemistry in your head. And you cannot just go cold turkey off those things. You will have a mental breakdown. So I got on an airplane a little bit after she told me the whole story. And I sat down, the guy sat next to me, he said, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a preacher, what do you do? He said, I'm a pharmacist, I own three pharmacies in California. You're just the man I'm looking for. He goes, what? I said, well, I want to tell you a story. I told him about being a preacher and praying for this young lady. He said, I said, but somebody told me you can't do that. And naturally it has to be supernatural. He said, absolutely, it takes 12 weeks to back somebody off of Prozac. And he said, I don't know her dosage, you don't either. I said, no, I don't. But she's had it for four years, she told me already in her system. He said, that would surely do it. He said it could normally take me 12 weeks to back somebody off of that, or maybe more if they were more involved with it than I'm imagining. Because your brain just doesn't, fit. you can't straighten that out just by quitting it. So he said to me, he looked at me, he's not even a preacher, he didn't even act like he was a believer. But he said, I think her taking, getting rid of the Prozac herself, cold turkey, is a bigger miracle than her being delivered from the depression. <laughs> well, then she just got a double, I guess. I don't tell people to throw their medicine away. I never do that. But I always tell them, if, it, if it's really God, then you just walk it out and go back to your doctor. He'll tell you that you don't need it. If he's an honest doctor, he'll tell you that. Anyway, I just thought it was a great miracle for her. And I felt for her, you know, that she's just single, raising that baby by herself, working somewhere. I don't know where she works. I don't know that much about her. But she was sweet to tell me about it because I didn't even know that that had happened to her. Anyway, praise God. So, so I don't know when I'll do that, but I'll, I'll probably give a, you know, altar call for stuff, you know. You know, people talk about issues, they talk about baggage. I, you know, I was kind of guy that had those big brass carts that you get at the nice hotels. I had like there was a train of those, about four of them. I, I was hooked on everything but phonics when I was a drug addict. <laughs> I'm done. Thank you. For <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Did you get anything tonight? Praise God. Amen. Just lift your hands and thank God that you got what you came for. For those of you that came up, you came to receive. Lift your hands and thank Him. Praise God for the impartation. Thank you for the anointing, Father. Thank you for the healings. Thank you, Father, they've laid hold. Thank you, Father God, they have it. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Glory be to God. Amen. Amen. I'm glad I came tonight. You may be seated. I, back whenever Dr. Dufresne went to heaven, I was thinking about this pretty much, you know, well, at the beginning of the service and then at the end, it just reminded me, I was thinking about it again. When Dr. Dufresne went to heaven, the Lord began to talk to me about some things that, that needed not, that he carried, that he walked in, that he operated in, that we need not lose in the body of Christ. And, uh, you know, some of the things about angels was one of them. And I'm so thankful for the ministry of Dr. Jacobs that picked that up. I mean, he's picked up a lot of other things, but he picked that up. And that uh, he's keeping that message and that revelation uh, active in the earth. And, and uh, for those that will hear it, amen? Uh, we're, we're a church that hears it. I don't really care what people think. I, don't really, I just want to know what the Word says. And I want, to, I want to have what the Word says and experience what the Word says. And I do have what the Word says. Amen. Praise God. This is not weird. This is not la-la land. You might think, well, that's over being emphasized. It's being underemphasized in the body of Christ. Amen. We need to emphasize it. Brother Hagin said one time, he said, you almost have to overemphasize something for a while to get things back in the middle of the road. And we're nowhere near in the body of Christ at large, nowhere near in the middle of the road concerning this. So I appreciate the message. Amen.